Hey there, welcome to Real Talk. I'm your host, Dave Allred, The Real Barman. So, you know those super annoying people who talk about themselves all the time and they tell you why they're so great and why you should listen and be impressed by what they do and who they are? Yeah? Well, that's what I'm going to do right now. So, strap yourself in and take a minute to find out why I'm so amazing and important. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, I'm not so important and I don't expect you to be impressed. But I believe my story is so similar to many of you out there who have been in this industry for a long time. So today's episode is for anyone who wants or has ever wanted to be an entrepreneur and do something different with their lives or be better at their jobs now. Okay, and if you're a bar or restaurant owner, you're already an entrepreneur, so congratulations. Okay, but if you are a manager or you fall into that category at all of being a person who does not like what they're doing for work or a career right now and you want something more from your life, like if you have that itch like I always had, then I'm going to help you find your way by sharing my story, which started from a scared to talk to anyone, introverted youth, to running my own online business that has now made me a millionaire. Okay, and again... I don't say any of that to brag or impress you in any way. It's more of a credibility thing. So you know you're not listening to Donnie the douchebag, some fake guru trying to sell you something. Okay, I'm not selling you anything today. I just want to talk real with you about what it's like and what it takes to become a successful entrepreneur. Okay, if that's a desire that you have. Because no matter the industry, the formula for success is always the same. And the truth is, when there's no advancement opportunity or at least very little advancement opportunity, like in your job and in your career, it's difficult to go to work every day with a feeling of gratitude and inspiration. Okay, without a feeling of purpose in our lives, what are we doing? Stagnation sets in, which leads you to eventually becoming a bitter old hag with lots of could have been thoughts dominating your mind. And we don't need any more bitter old hags. We have enough of those. You see them sitting on rocking chairs on their porches trying to burn holes in you with their poisonous glare as they knit a scarf or something. All right, but I digress. All right, now, I could start from the very beginning when I got my first busing job as a naive 16-year-old at a greasy Chinese restaurant in Redding, California. Okay, It was run by a husband who sat at the counter all day reading a Chinese paper and sipping cup after cup of hot black coffee, and his wife, who ran around the place like a miniature Chinese Hitler, barking at me in half English and half Chinese, and hitting me in the back of the head with a wet dish towel every time I didn't perform whatever task she had me doing. Okay, but that's a little too far back. I could talk about how, after college, I lied on my application and said I had servant experience when I didn't, which led me to get hired at a claim jumper in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, where I had to wear a long black apron and a sheriff's badge and a ridiculous bolo tie. I hated it. Okay, I was there three years before I moved to P.F. Chang's and became a bartender, making over $300 per night in tips, more money than any of my friends had at that time. Okay, I could also talk about how I then bartended at more than a dozen bars over the next 15 years before moving into management and a GM position. All right, but you've heard that story before. All right, maybe you've lived that story before, the story of a young person who stumbles into the restaurant industry one day and is never seen again, okay? So let's start in the middle then, because this was the turning point. And I'm going to see if I can turn on my campfire story charm and lay this out for you. I'm going to get all up in my head here, close my eyes, picture it. You can close your eyes too, unless you're driving, okay? It's a sweltering and steamy day in late August of 2011. I sat on a folding chair in my living room, sweating through a dirty t-shirt and shorts, and my fingers are positioned loosely on on the shiny black keys of a stenograph machine. That's right, the ones used by court reporters. And the AC wasn't working, and my wife, had taken our two kids to the community pool to try and beat the heat and leave me alone to practice on my machine. Okay, mostly, 
it was their excuse to get out of the house and away from me because to say I was a tad moody at that time would be a massive understatement and a distortion of the truth. Okay, more accurately, I was flat out depressed. I had spent the past three years desperately looking for something to get me out of the bar business, okay, out of the long hours and the late nights and the weekends. So I could be able to align my work schedule with my wife, who was a school teacher at the time, and my friends who had you know normal daytime jobs. And most importantly, to my kids who went to school in the day and never saw their dad because as soon as they got home, I would leave for work and be gone until 2 a.m. Okay? And I didn't mind the bartending or the managing. I'd done it my whole career. But I hated the lifestyle now that I was in my 40s. And I wanted more than anything to have the freedom of having a choice. I wanted my kids to have a father who was present. I wanted to be able to say yes to my friends who invited me over for a barbecue on a Saturday night. And I wanted to have a relationship with my wife. I simply wanted a life that I could be proud of, okay? And being an entrepreneur at heart, I had spent those past three years putting my hand in more business ventures and job opportunities than you can even imagine. And I had read stories from other online entrepreneurs and how they had struggled mightily for years until they finally broke through and they were rewarded the life they'd been searching for and working at for so long. I, I love those stories. They inspired me. The problem was, I only seem to experience the struggling part, okay? never reaching that nirvana part that I always read about. And as a result, all those years of struggle, struggle and failure started piling up and weighed upon my back like a pallet of cinder blocks. I hated my job. My marriage was falling apart. My wife constantly asked when I was going to change careers so we could live a quote unquote normal life which of course made me feel like a colossal loser, which is how I ended up somehow agreeing to a career in gulp court reporting. I know, right? Ridiculous. I'm talking 1970s beehive hairdo lady in a polyester dress, court reporting. That's my version of rock bottom. Okay, some people find themselves on their knees in a gas station bathroom trading sexual favors for heroin, for me, it was sitting in a gray folding, a gray metal folding chair, cramped and erect in front of my court reporting machine, clacking away in the living room. Seriously, rock fucking bottom. And the problem was, I had tried everything. So when my wife, who had been researching careers for me, suddenly decided I should try court reporting, I had no choice but to reluctantly agree because I was out of ideas. Okay, but after two months of learning shorthand court reporting typing, I had about all I could take. All right, and that's when August 23rd, 2011 happened. The final straw or the final cinder block or log or whatever, however you want to put it, that broke this camel's back. So, the wife and kids, they've been gone a couple hours at the pool, and I just sat there staring at that olive green machine. The shorthand practice book was sitting on a tray to the right, and I knew that I was never going to do this for a living. I wasn't even lying to myself like I was about some of the other things I tried that didn't work. I knew I was not going to do this. I was just buying time to satisfy my wife until I could figure out what to do. The problem was, I had no idea what that, what that was. I felt like a man on the side of a cliff hanging on to a tiny root, and at any moment it was going to snap, and I was going to fall backwards 100 feet onto a deadly floor of jagged rocks. Now, I'm not sure how long I was sitting there staring at that machine with my fingers resting on the keys. I was just doing nothing. I was just staring. I was five minutes, 15, an hour. I had no idea, but I do remember without warning, and before I could even sense its approach, this is all true by the way, an overwhelming feeling of dread and desperation, and worst of all, panic overcame me. And without real realizing what I was doing, I jumped out of my chair, I grabbed the stenograph machine, and I hurled it at our sliding glass door 
with an alarming scream that came somewhere deep inside my tortured soul. Okay, and the glass was not thick and tempered like some sliding glass doors. It was fragile and weak. And when the machine struck the glass, shards exploded everywhere. Okay, I was lucky not to lose an eye, but I came close. Okay, a decent sized chunk of glass lodged itself just above my right eye, in the eyebrow to be precise. It would later, later require 14 stitches to patch up. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to show you right now, you can see a picture of it right here. It's pretty gnarly. And I have no recollection of grabbing a towel after that, but I must have because I do remember sitting on the couch holding it to my forehead to slow the bleeding. And I just held it there and I waited. I waited for my wife to come home. And I waited for that look of disappointment and agony on her face that would provide a perfect picture of how I had failed her again. How I'd failed the family again. And it was a look that would possibly send me down a rabbit hole of despair that I might never return from. Okay, is that dramatic enough storytelling for you? Well, I was right about one thing. The look on my wife's face when she walked through the door was one of agony. But there was no disappointment in those eyes. There was just pure concern and sympathy and love. And she dropped to her knees in front of me and we cried together. And she eventually lifted the towel from my head to assess the damage. And then when she saw that I would live, she took my hands in hers and she looked me straight in the eye and she said something I'll never forget. She said, it doesn't matter what you do for a living as long as we're together. Now forget about all this other crap. Let's stop trying to run from an industry that you've become an expert in and simply do something different with it. And I'll never forget that. And I am internally grateful to her for those words. And the relief that rushed through my body can only be compared to what it feels like to know your ex execution's been called off. Right, and perhaps that's a little dramatic. I've never been on death row, but I'll never forget that day. That was the day everything changed for me. Okay, that was the day I joined countless others who hit rock bottom and used it to propel my life to levels of success I had only ever dreamed about. Okay, and as they say, without the dark, there is no light. And that light is the beacon that each of us is striving to find every day in our lives. Okay? Now, I want you to understand that I have been trying to get out of managing in the nightlife for a few years now. All right? As I mentioned in the last Real Talk podcast, I call our industry the quicksand industry because you wander in one day, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and 30 years later, you're up to your neck with no way to escape. Okay, that was me. And I wasn't qualified to do anything else. You know, I can write, but making money as a writer is no easy task. And it took, could take years to gain traction necessary to become, become relevant. So for three years, you can't imagine the things I tried or the things I considered trying in order to get out of bartending and bar managing. Okay, I ran a semi-successful in-home tutoring business for over a year. I had eight tutors on staff working for me, going into homes to help tutor high school students, but I really had zero passion for it. Uh, and for the amount of time I spent on it, I wasn't making enough money. I was still working two jobs, all right? So that was even less time with my family. Uh, I did basketball trainings. I worked for my brother-in-law's uh, contracting business, loading pallets onto trucks, but you know, those things are heavy. And the list goes on until I landed on court reporting and the bloody eyebrow. And this is the short version of the story. It really is. It was years of trying to figure things out because I had no one to guide me, which ended up being a good thing in the long run because the more you have to figure shit out yourself, the faster you learn, okay? And the deeper you learn instead of someone just telling you how to do it. And here's where the turning point came. This is where rock bottom people either seep through the cracks of those rocks and are never heard from again, or they bounce and start heading to the surface. And luckily, I bounced, all right? And I have my wife to thank for it, okay? Only days after the great court reporting keyboard incident of 2011, my wife found something. 
All right, something real, something that fell within my field of expertise. Okay, she found a company that was taking inventory and providing reports to bars and restaurants, and it was saving them hours of time and thousands of dollars per month. And immediately I thought, I can do that. I can count and weigh things. And the problem was, this particular company was a franchise, which meant if I wanted to be a part of it, I would need to invest $60,000 to learn how to use their software and prospect for bars to find new clients. Not, you know, I don't know. Do you have $60,000 buried in a coffee can in the backyard? I know I didn't. So that's when I set off to figure it all out by myself. Okay, And in the beginning, you know, something new is exciting, like a relationship in your teens. Like you're all giddy and you can't picture anything going wrong. Life is just great. Okay, but until you do it, you have no idea how difficult it is to start a business on your own. Even sometimes now, like I'll look back at my journey and I feel like Andy Dufresne and the Shawshank Redemption. Okay, crawled through a river of shit and came out clean on the other side. Okay, remember that line from Morgan Freeman? I have a horrible Morgan Freeman uh, imitation, but that was the best. Because much like Andy, my story has plenty of unjust and heartbreak and long stretches of hopelessness, as well as redemption when my bar auditor business finally took off. The only difference was I didn't have a calm, charismatic African-American inmate that could get me things and offer sage advice. And if you haven't seen The Shawshank Redemption, you should be slapped in the face with a wet ham because it's one of the best stories of patience, perseverance, and redemption ever. So go watch it. And if you've already seen it, go watch it again. Now, like I said, the beginning of the business was exciting. I took over the inventory at my bar and I dove in. Counting and weighing bottles, I was trying different inventory softwares at the time that could tell me the variance of what was rang in by my bartenders and what was actually poured by my bartenders so I could see the difference. Okay, and this was 2011, remember? So apps were a thing, but there weren't many options for inventory at the time. Okay, but I did find a software that was good enough and I set out to become an inventory expert. Okay, and our bar benefited because suddenly with all the tracking I was doing, I found leaks and we saved a ton of money. Okay, yeah, it actually worked. Okay, but then reality hit because in order to actually make money as a bar auditor, you have to get clients. Okay, this is why business is the same no matter what industry you're in. A jewelry store, a clothing boutique, a plumber, a restaurant, you need to get the attention of people first to get them to notice you for a chance at a sale. Okay, that meant I needed to go out and speak with bar owners and managers and sell my services. And I'll tell you some right now, I was a big pussy when it came to selling. I fucking hate selling. Okay, when I was younger, I couldn't even ask someone for a ride home from school or basketball practice because I didn't want to put someone out. So when I realized that I was going to have to go door to door and sell like a vacuum cleaner salesman out of the 1950s, I almost quit right there. And the only thing that pushed me to keep going is, you got it, rock bottom. Okay, there was no more room to go in that direction, the down direction, down there with the blowjobs for heroin people. And I wish I had my first attempted sale on camera because it's hilarious. I was a sight to see. The first place I ever walked into was an Italian restaurant in Danville, California, where I actually live now. I didn't then. Uh, and so there I am in the parking lot uh, looking in the rearview mirror like trying to pump myself like a boxer before a big fight or like one of those scared teenage boys in a predictable romantic comedy where he's trying to figure out the perfect thing to say to ask a girl out, right? That was me. I'm not kidding. I'm like, uh, you know, how you doing today, sir or ma'am? Uh, my name's Dave Allred and I own a company called Bar Patrol. No, no, no. I own a company called Bar Patrol, right? All that shit, okay? And then finally... I'd get out of my car and I'd walk almost to the door of the restaurant and then I'd see a group of people walking in right before me to go eat lunch and I'd turn around and I'd go back to the car to gather some more courage. Okay, I probably should have brought a bottle of Jack with me to help me sack up, but 
I did that like four times, you know, up to the door, back to the car before I finally got to nerve to walk in and ask the hostess if the owner or manager was in. And of course I was hoping they wouldn't be there. All right. But sure enough, the GM was in and the hostess went off to find him while I stood there and waited, sweating profusely, despite it being pleasantly air conditioned in the restaurant. So I'm scared to death. And so a couple minutes later, here comes the GM. You know, he shakes my hand. He's very friendly, warm smile. And I go into my pitch. I'm like, hi, you know, I'm Dave Allred. I know you're busy. I just want to quickly introduce myself. I own a company called Bar Patrol. And I work with bars throughout the Bay Area, even though I hadn't yet. Wink, wink. All right, I was in fake it until you make it mode. And so I go on, you know, uh, I help bars save five to $6,000 per month by tracking their inventory, which reduces losses, increases profits, and saves you time, right? And my heart's just racing. And it's at this time that I see, you know, the look, okay? The look I dread, the look that's more like a shadow falling across his face that tells me he has suddenly realized that he's in a trap. He knows who I am and he knows what this little charade is. Okay, it's not a customer coming in to book a large party reservation later that night. It's a cheesy salesperson trying to sell him some shit he does not need. And it's the fear of that look that kept me turning around and going back to my car over and over again. Because as a GM of bars and restaurants myself, I had been sold to hundreds of times also, and I hated it. And yet, here I was, okay, violating the trust between two kindred souls as restaurant managers. And I hated how that made me feel. Okay, but instead of telling me to fuck off and that he was not interested at all in what I had to sell and throwing me out on my ear, he told me that sounded amazing and when could I start? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He told me he wasn't interested and I left with my tail between my legs. All right, but I had finally ripped the Band-Aid off. I was no longer a door-to-door -door salesman virgin. Okay, but I was certainly a lousy salesman lover. And nevertheless, at that time, I was sure now that things would get easier. All right, they didn't. In fact, it never got easy. I hated it every time. And I'll stop there with the stories of walking into bars and restaurants and awkwardly selling my services. Just know there was a lot of those and a lot of rejections. All right, I walked into hundreds of bars. And I would wake up in the morning with this ice ball of dread in my stomach because I knew what I had to do that day. It was like the opposite of Christmas morning every morning. I knew I would get up and I'd get the kids ready for school because my wife was a school teacher and she would be gone already. And I would drop them off. And by 11 o'clock, I would force myself to go out and sell the bars. All right, then I would pick up the kids from school. I'd grab something to eat. My wife would come home. I'd quickly kiss her and then off to work at my bar until midnight or later if it was the weekend. And then I'd start all over again. All right, but then finally, I got lucky and I met someone in my bar. I was having a conversation with someone. I was, he was asking what I was doing these days and I told him what I was doing on the side with my new auditor business. And he told me that he knew the owner of a bar in Oakland who might, who might like to know what I was doing. And he got me a meeting and I nailed it. I'm gonna give you the short version. Uh, and I got, I got my first account. It was called Rudy's Can't Fail Cafe in Oakland, California. And I actually had them as a client for four years. So from here, that was the first stage of my business, and I'm going to skip over some of the details, but I spent the next four years counting inventory for bars and also selling the bars when someone would drop me in my services, and I hated that part every time, okay? But at any given time, I had eight to 10 bars as clients. That's about as much as I could handle, and I would count inventory for them once per week, and they all paid me about 1000 bucks per month to save them a ton of money. And as much as I hated selling, I had created a script that actually worked. Okay, and I landed two P.F. Chang locations and three Outbacks. Okay, big corporate giants that wanted my services. So business was good and I was making good money, but I was still working two jobs. And some nights I'd finish up at my bar at midnight and I'd drive 45 minutes to Burlingame to count an inventory that took me two to three hours and then I'd get home at 4 a.m. If that was my life, okay? And you might ask why I would work two jobs when I was trying to get rid of one of them, and it's because for that final year, which was then 2015, I had been in my wife's ear 
about building my own inventory app and software so that I could sell it to bar owners online across the country and stop doing the grind of inventory myself. Because over those four years, I can't even tell you how many inventories I had counted. It was like thousands of inventories. And I was an expert on calculations and I knew the software inside and out and I knew I could make it better. But my wife was nervous, to say the least. She didn't want to mess up a good thing and I had become obsessed with the online space, meaning running an online business. I would listen to podcasts during all those hours counting inventories, learning from others how to start and run an online business. Okay, because here's the thing. Since I was in my teens, I've been obsessed with having a business where checks just show up in the mailbox. And I'd seen others pitch this idea on infomercials. Okay, most notably, a man named Don LaPree. And if you haven't heard of him, go look him up. Okay, my wife and I, at the age of 23, purchased his little entrepreneur kit. Okay, and he was teaching people how to place little ads in the back of magazines and newspapers. Remember, this was back in the early 90s. Okay, these ads were for dating lines and psychic lines where you had to pay like $2.99 per minute on the phone. And then we would get a portion of that money and the checks would just come rolling in. Okay, well, the checks never came rolling in. And Don LaPree, after making $50 million off of suckers like me, was arrested for fraud and went to prison where he eventually committed suicide. But I could never shake that fantasy of money just automatically rolling in while I was sitting on a beach somewhere. So building an app or having it built for me and the software where people would pay me a monthly subscription seemed like the perfect way to make that dream come true. Okay, and I'll tell you right now, I will never discourage someone from following their dream, no matter how outlandish it might seem. But I will warn you that going the software route is like walking through a desert of poisonous snakes. Because if the snake bites don't kill you, you most certainly die of thirst. Okay, that's my depressing metaphor for how difficult, difficult it is to find a development team that knows what the fuck they're doing. Hey, I'm now on my sixth development team. And they're good because I can afford it now. But back then, I had very little money, and so I had to shoestring it, which meant the software was a piece of shit, okay? So from 2015 to 2017, here's what my life looked like then. Wake up, kids to school, all that. Uh, either in the morning or the night, I'd count inventory for my clients, for my bar auditing business. Okay, You had to do it in the morning or the night because you can't count during restaurant business hours. So after counting one in the morning... I'd come home, I'd run reports for them, and then I'd work on my online business, which consisted of the YouTube channel I'd started and the websites I'd built. Okay, then off to run the bar until midnight, I'd come home and I'd chat on Skype with my development team who was working out of India at the time because that was their daytime and so that's when they were available. Okay, the software was extremely complicated, so I would be up till 5 a.m. usually helping with the app and software and all the bugs that were going on and all the troubleshooting. Okay, then I'd wake up at 7 o'clock and I'd do it all over again. And sometimes I'd get a nap, but for two years, I probably averaged two to three hours of sleep a night. And when I, fi when I finally released the app in 2016, the code was spaghetti code, so there was problem after problem, bug after bug. Okay, it was the world's longest running headache day in and day out. And meanwhile, my wife and I had begun to argue again because she wasn't believing in the online business anymore. Okay, I was dumping all of our money into the software. I had even less time with her and the kids than I did in 2011, and it didn't seem to be going anywhere. Okay, I dropped all but two of my bar auditing clients, two of the Outback locations. So we were living month to month again, and I remember being at my computer at like 3 a.m. Uh, chatting with my development team on Skype and I'd get an email notification that my account balance had dropped below $25. Like we literally had like $17 in the bank and I'd have to run down to the ATM at three in the morning and deposit $200 in cash I had from tips because I was still bartending to make extra money. I got that email no notification a lot. Okay, and every time I would break out into a cold sweat wondering if we would make it through the month, okay? Don't worry, we're getting to the end. I know it seems like 
I'm in dire straits with no money in the bank and a perpetually angry wife on me all the time. But since I'm here telling the story, you know I don't die. So don't worry your pretty little heads. All right, now we're going to jump to 2017. I had been making YouTube videos for how to become a bartender all the way back in 2013. I was making these videos. Uh, this is because I had built an online course for how to become a bartender and I was trying to sell it. So I was driving traffic there. Okay, and here are a couple of my awesome videos from 2013. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see a uh, fantastic high de definition video. Uh, I think this was with, with like my iPhone 4 or something. And I would make videos to help people become a bartender, which is like the rock star profession of the blue car color world. So it was something that people really looked for online. But despite those amazing videos you just saw, my sales were low. I sold like maybe two courses per month. I can't quite remember, but it was low. So my wife and I argued about the online business a lot. And she wanted me to go back to selling bars on my bar auditing service because it was a real job, but I could see the vision, right? And I was doing everything my online mentors were teaching me on the podcast I was listening to. I was putting out content. I was making videos and writing blog posts. And I told her, that we just needed to be patient, all right? And of course she was like, patient? I've been patient for 15 fucking years waiting for you to do something different. You know, how much longer am I supposed to wait? And on and on it went. And I certainly couldn't blame her, okay? But I just couldn't stop the path I was on. I was obsessed, okay? Until finally around September or October of 2017, Something started to happen online. Okay, the almighty tipping point I'd been promising to my wife finally started to tip. Okay, all the videos I put out and all the blog posts I'd written finally found its way to the surface, okay, to the top of YouTube and the Google rankings. And I remember in those two months, I suddenly got like 10 bar course sales and I had like five bars sign up for Bar Patrol to use the inventory app I'd built. And we were over the moon. Like we thought we'd made it. All right. In November, we got like 10 or 12 bar patrol signups and these were recurring revenue subscriptions. So we were building business upon business. It was $69 per month to use it. Uh, and it still is by the way, I have proudly never raised my prices because we're helping independent bars and restaurants succeed. Okay. We know what it's like to be a small business. Okay. So as we go around, by July of 2018, we were making about $5,000 per month. And once Thanksgiving rolled around, we were at about $8,000 per month, and my wife told me to quit my job. And that scared me because if something went wrong, I felt like we had no safety net. And at that time, I was on, I think, maybe my fourth development team, so they were better. And the, But the software still wasn't as stable as it needed to be. Okay, But she told me that... We needed to trust in the universe. This was our path. And so on December 15th, 2018, I worked my last shift in a bar. After having worked in bars and restaurants for 31 years at that point. Okay, so in 2018, we made $94,000. 2019, we hit $206,000. And then 2020, even through COVID, we hit $390,000 that year. And the income has pretty much increased by 50 to 100% every year since. Okay. We've also since then added our new text and email marketing software, Restaurant Patrol, which is doing well. So I was finally able to achieve my dream of checks in the mail or in modern day now deposits directly into my bank account. And I've been able to go to all of my kids' sporting events. My daughter is still playing basketball in college and I'm able to go to every single one of her games. I coached my son in basketball in high school. I'm basically able to say yes to any invite anywhere, anytime now because I make money while I sleep, okay? As was my dream, okay? So that's my story. And even though I'm sure it seems like I was rambling, if I told you every detail of what me and my wife and my family went through during that time, we'd be here for like eight hours because it was a lot more than I even let on. Okay, and I can't thank my wife enough for sticking with me through it all. You know, she's been like my business partner. She gives me new ideas. She challenges me. It's all been worth it.
Okay. And with that said, the greatest gift I got from starting Bar Patrol as an inventory auditor business, like, which I didn't even mention before, was the hundreds of bar and restaurant owners and managers I got to meet and know and learn from during those four years. Okay. I already knew quite a bit about the restaurant industry from my three decades of experience, but to have like this mastermind group of owners and managers to speak with every day increased my knowledge and my expertise tenfold. Okay. And I still speak with lots of them today. I'm able to ask them like what works for them, what doesn't work. Okay. And I'm able to try out their POS system so I can make the best recommendations to my audience. Okay. And whereas each of them are all very knowledgeable and experienced in their own ways individually, I'm able to soak up all of their knowledge collectively, which has allowed me to do what I do and help so many people on a grander scale because I'm online now and I can reach a lot more of them. So I only mention that because I am so grateful to all of them for everything they did and continue to do for me. You know, and if you're one of them watching right now, thank you very much. It just makes me want to pay it forward to people like you. Okay, and so before we go today, I want to make sure you understand that my purpose of telling my story was not so I could talk about myself for 30 minutes or so you could learn how to start an inventory auditor business, but to inspire or motivate anyone who has that burn and that itch like I did to become an expert at what they do so they can rise to another level. Okay, nothing feels better than taking action on a daily basis for something you're excited about, okay? Something that's yours, okay? And I don't know what that is for you, okay? Might be doing what you're doing at your bar and restaurant right now, okay? But just taking it to another level. Or maybe you wanna switch industries and do something else, something that you love, okay? And what I've learned is that it's all the same formula. It doesn't matter the industry, okay? It's learn everything you can about that industry so you can become an expert, it's gain attention from people who like what you have to offer and then provide the best experience that they've ever had. Okay, and that might be a little oversimplistic, but it's how it works in a nutshell. Okay, the other lesson here is that 98% of people who start something quit. Okay, they might stick with it for a year or two or for, for three years, five years, but they don't work on it long enough. Okay, they don't suffer enough to reach the dream. And I'm telling you right now, if you don't ever quit, you will get there. It's inevitable, okay? But 98% of people quit. From the time I started Bar Patrol in 2011, it took seven years until 2018 when I was able to quit my job and just do what I love to do, okay? And maybe it'll only take you four years or two years or a year, I don't know. But the reason 98% of people are not successful, successful, sorry, is because they don't have the grit and the patience to see it through to the end. Okay, when things get hard, they quit, which means they will never be part of the 2%. So you need to ask yourself who you want to be and where you want to go from here. Okay? And if you don't if you want to be part of the 98%, you know, that doesn't create their own thing, that's fine. Okay? You might be happy in doing what you're doing. You don't have to follow my path. Okay, there's no judgment here. Okay, you do you, boo. Okay? Well, I've already rambled on long enough for today. I have more restaurant laws of success coming in the upcoming podcast. We'll get back to more of the restaurant stuff. But if you want more of the entrepreneur side of things and how to get there, you know, let me know in the comments um, what you like, and I'll make more videos for it. Okay? Thanks for watching and for listening. I know it's kind of a long one today. I do appreciate you. I'm going to see you next time. I'm out.